Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Felder. Okay, it's good to see everybody back, and once again, we like to remind our television audience that uh, you see coffee cups and refreshments on these tables. We produce four of these programs in one afternoon, and after every half hour, we take a coffee break and time of fellowship, and uh, it's just been a, a good way of doing it, we think. And again, we always like to emphasize that we're not associated with any one denomination. We don't attack anybody. And all we try to do is get everybody, whatever your background, into the book and see what the Word of God says. Not what some denomination says, not what Les Feldick says. What does the book say? In fact, some folks up in Minnesota coined a little tune, and they'll get a kick out of every time I say this, and that was the title of their little song, What Does the Book Say? And uh, it went on from there. But anyway, we uh, always like to thank our TV audience for your support, your prayers, oh, how we enjoy the knowing the knowledge that you're praying for us and uh, for your letters as well as your financial help. For those of you here in the studio, we appreciate the fact that you come in. And uh, I like to let our audience know that way, way back, Iris and I provided all the coffee and all the refreshments. But uh, when the group got this large, the ladies here relieved her of all the refreshments. So Iris and I still make the coffee. We like to use good ranch water, you know. <laughs> I didn't say branch water. <laughs> I said ranch water. So we make the coffee at home and uh, tie down the pots. But the ladies up here have been providing the refreshments, and we thank you so much for that. Okay, huh? Yeah, and the men. Yeah, I guess some of the guys. I, I know Ken does. He, that's one of his favorite hobbies is baking and stuff. So we appreciate whoever you are. Now, again, Iris is going to let me take the chance. Uh, we've always sort of avoided doing anything that date our program because we never know when they'll be viewed again. But uh, most of you are aware now that uh, we're on a, a uh, what shall I call it, a timed production. We... Uh, keep making new programs once a month, but the daily programs are reruns. But anyway, uh, we're making plans to once again take a tour back to the Holy Land. And uh, since this is March of 2004, we're tentatively making plans for March or April of 2005. And so if any of you are aware of that or interested, why contact us and we'll get the information to you. Providing the Lord doesn't come. Uh, we still hope constantly that the Lord will intervene with that trumpet call. I'm still a firm believer of the pre-trib rapture and uh, as the world seemingly is getting so ripe for the tribulation, it just tells us that we're getting close. Okay, so much for that. Back to the little book of Jude where we left off in our last program. I was in verse 5 and I ran out of time, so we'll go back to it. Where James says, I will therefore, because of the constant fear of false teachers coming in amongst the believers, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, in other words, this is nothing new, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, so we go all the way back to the Exodus, same Lord, the same Lord that was evident all the way up through Israel's history is the one who had now come in the flesh at Bethlehem and had walked the three years of ministry, had been crucified, resurrected, gone back to glory. And the promise was that in a short order he'd be coming back and yet fulfill all those Old Testament promises. Listen, this book would fall apart if God did not fulfill every prophecy. They have to be fulfilled or it's not the Word of God. And so we know that all these Old Testament prophecies concerning Israel's glory and the kingdom on earth are still coming. God has interrupted it in His sovereignty, but it's still coming. And so even though they were looking for it in their lifetime as these little letters were written, now as I said in our last program, we are right back in the same thing 1900 some years later We've got Israel back in the land. we got the appearance of the revived Roman Empire there in Western Europe. The world is getting in perplexity. Everything is getting ripe 
for the fulfillment of the prophetic scriptures. All right, so Jude now then is taking his Jewish believers back to Egypt. Well, we can do the same thing. We all study the Exodus and how God miraculously bought the people out of slavery and took them through the Red Sea. So it's just as appropriate for us to remember these things as it was for the Jewish believers to whom Jude is writing. All right, so he says, remember that when the Lord saved the people out of the land of Egypt, miraculously, after the plagues had pummeled Egypt, and then you remember on uh, the night of the Passover when death went through Egypt, and that riot really triggered the release then of the Jewish nation out of Egypt, and they went all the way to the Red Sea, and then there was the obstacle. And you know, I still like to use that as a beautiful picture of our own salvation today. There Israel, coming out of abject slavery, no freedom, no liberty, browbeaten from sunup to sundown. And now all of a sudden they're sprung loose, but they're still on the wrong side of the Red Sea and no place to go. Mountains on both sides, the Egyptian army and the chariots behind them and the Red Sea in front. And I always like to remind, like Jude is saying, remember, did God say, well, hurry up and do something? Don't just stand there, get to work. No. What did he say? Stand still. Don't try to do anything. You're helpless. Let the power of God exert itself. And that's what happened. God opened the Red Sea. Now listen, have you ever stopped to think how much faith it took knowing that that water was backed up? I don't think it was within sight. I think that was such a long span that they couldn't see that wall of water to the left, nor could they see that wall of water to the right. So when they stepped into the dry bed of the Red Sea, what did it take? Faith. My, that took faith. How did they know it wouldn't come rushing back in the next five minutes? Well, they didn't except by faith. And so they walked through on dry ground by faith, coming up on the other side now, a redeemed people. Well, that's where we are. We were in the slave market of sin, hopelessly lost. But because of Christ's redemptive work, and by faith we've appropriated it, we too now have come through the death, burial, and resurrection, and we're on the other side, and we now experience God's saving grace. Beautiful picture. Oh, but the pity of it is, after they had gone through by faith, went all the way down to Sinai under Moses' leadership, and we're going to see that a little more, a little later in the book here. And now God takes them up to Kadesh Barnea to go in and have the promised land, to take it by faith. They didn't have to worry about those oversized Canaanites. They didn't have to worry about the fact that they were larger and more fit for war because God said he would drive them out with hornets. And yet, well, how did they respond? In unbelief, abject unbelief. And said, no, we can't. We can't do it. The people are too big. The cities are walled. Well, what did God tell them? Take it. So then what was the result? They went back into the wilderness and they died like flies until that whole generation of unbelieving Israelites are gone. What a sad commentary. Now, I can't answer the question. I've asked it for years. As long as I've been teaching, I've had this question. If they came out of the slavery of Egypt, they came through the Red Sea by faith, were they all what we call saved? Well, if that's the case, then why just a few months later they get up to Kadesh Barnea and their faith is totally absent and they go back into the wilderness and die, which he says here, they believe not. I can't answer it. That's in God's hands. Now, that's why I've always made the comment, it's hard to put your thumb on Old Testament salvation. Were they saved once for all, or were they saved and lost? That's what it would indicate here. They were saved out of Egypt, but when they returned back on Kadesh Barnea, it says he destroyed them that 
what? Believe not. Tough question. I haven't got the answer. That's where God is sovereign, thank goodness. And the same way today, people will say, well, so-and-so did this, and they did this. Do you think they're saved? I don't know. Only God looks on the heart. Now, we can be fruit inspectors, absolutely, if their life completely is in total de uh, disobedience and in total opposition to the Scriptures, then as I inspect their fruit, I think I can come to a conclusion. But I can't look at the heart. Neither can you. Neither can anybody else. No human being can tell another human being, well, you're safe, because we can't look on the heart. But it's a good lesson here. How that we just cannot determine the salvation experience of these Old Testament Jews. So we're to remember it. What all took place? How that God miraculously brought them out. Brought them through the Red Sea. Took them to Sinai. Gave them the law, the tabernacle, the priesthood. Ready to take them into the promised land. And then in unbelief, they turned away. All except Moses and Aaron and Joshua and Caleb. Might have been a few others, not that I'm aware of, but whatever. Jude says they were not believers. Verse 6. Now we jump into a different category. Angels. Now I don't deal a lot with angels because they're, again, they're just too much. You can't put your handle on it. And so I'm always a little bit cautious when we start teaching things concerning angels. <clears throat> but here we have angels who kept not their first estate. But they left. In other words, by choice, they turned away from their sovereign God as angels. And they left their own habitation. Now, as a result of their own free will choice, turning their back upon the righteous God who was over them, where are they? Well, they're reserved in everlasting chains under darkness, they're in some place that God has prepared for them, and they're waiting for the what? The judgment of the great day. And God's going to judge those fallen angels. Now, I always like to think of the time that Lucifer fell, and that would take us all the way back to Isaiah 14, if you will. No, I almost have to look at both of them. Ezekiel 28 first, and then Isaiah 14. Let's go back and look at Ezekiel 28. Now, it's been a long time since we've covered this. Unless you watched the daily program in the last few months, we were back in Genesis. But in Ezekiel 28, we have some interesting language. Ezekiel 28, we're going to start at verse 13. Ezekiel 28, verse 13. And God is speaking through the prophet. And he says, Thou hast been in Eden, the Garden of Eden, the Garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, onyx, jasper, all these beautiful gemstones. <clears throat> the workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. In other words, he was a functioning angelic being. Verse 14. Here's who he is. Thou art the anointed cherub, or angel, that covereth, or ruleth. In other words, this individual we're dealing with was the ruling angel over some sort of an angelic kingdom. All right? God says, I have set you so in his sovereignty. He placed this angel in this particular place of beautiful gemstones, as well as control over uh, angel an angelic host. All right? I have set thee so, thou wast upon the holy mountain, or the kingdom of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect. He was a sinless angel. From the day that thou wast created. So here we know he's a created being. Until, at some point in time, iniquity was found in thee. Now we drop back a few pages to Isaiah. And that's where we find the iniquity. And it's so plain. Isaiah 14. <clears throat> now we'll drop in at verse 12. Isaiah 14, 
Verse 12. I'll have to wait till most of you at least have found it. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. Now watch this carefully. This is interesting. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Now remember what he is. He's a ruling angel over a kingdom of angelic inhabitants. How art thou cut down to the ground, who dost weaken the nations, that is, later in his activity? Now here was his fall. For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. In other words, he would assume God's position. <clears throat> I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the Most High. Doesn't that sound like old Satan today? He still thinks he's going to do it. You know, a group of us were talking just the other night. You sometimes wonder about this creature. He's got tremendous knowledge and intellect. Is he so stubborn and still is so determined that he's going to be victorious over God? Or can't he read? Because we know what his end is, but he must not. He doesn't quit. Of course, I've always said that's the same way with liberals in politics and in religion. They never quit. And Satan's the same way. He will not quit, even though he knows he's defeated. See? All right. So he says, I will be like the Most High. I'm going to usurp God's throne. But God answers, thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. And of course we know that that is his coming doom. But in the meantime, you see, he's doing everything in his power to thwart God's program. Now, let me come back to Jude a minute. Back to Jude, verse 6. Satan, of course, Lucifer, did not experienced the incarceration that his followers did. And from Revelation chapter 12, it would seem that one-third of the angelic host followed Satan in his rebellion. And those are the ones waiting here under the chains of darkness for the judgment day. And of course, Lucifer, who we know as Satan, will not have benefit of judgment. He will go straight to the lake of fire when time ends as we know it. But... Uh, Choices. Maybe this is a good place. I sometimes wonder where I can bring this in. You see, all the way up from the beginning of, you might say, creation, and, and even right here, these angels were faced with what? Choice. They were evidently a, a free-willed creature, and they had choice. But, you see, Lucifer and the third that followed him did like a lot of people do today. They chose how? Wrong. They chose wrong in order to satisfy the self-will. And all you have to do is just look across the whole spectrum of humanity. And isn't that always the problem? To satisfy the self, momentarily, they choose wrong. Now I think you folks know our television audience know, and for you fellows that are watching me in prison right now, my, we have such a tremendous ministry amongst prison inmates. I think almost every state in the Union. And invariably, they admit they made bad choices, starting maybe when they were teenagers, maybe later. But all their problems compound from making horrible choices. Or people will call with their marital difficulty. And the first thing I tell them, look, I'm not a marriage counselor. Don't even pretend to be. But I can tell you one thing. Somewhere along the line, you made bad choices. And they're the first to admit that. All right, so what, what prompts us as human beings, God's creator, crea created being, what prompts us to make these bad choices? Well, I think the devil does. 
Satan would like nothing better than to see the whole human race rebel against the Creator as the angels did. Because he's the master of rebellion. So all of these bad choices, now not that Satan rides on the shoulder of every human being, don't get me wrong, but he has a way of influencing the human race to make these bad choices. All right, but now the point I'm really wanting to make is concerning the nation of Israel. Now we know that anti-Semitism is coming up much like it did in the 30s, especially over in Europe. And then it prompts me, and I want to remind my listening audience, why have day one, since day one, why have the Jewish people suffered such hatred and such opposition from the rest of the world? Well, it isn't because of their unique makeup. It isn't because of their personality traits. It isn't because of their looks. It's because this adversary of God, this Lucifer, fallen now and we know as Satan, knows that if he can knock Israel out of the earth's existence, then God's whole program falls apart. Because you see, as I've said over and over on this program, Israel is at the heart of everything that God does. And if you take the heart out, that kills the whole. And this is what Satan knows. And so all you have to do is just reflect back. Just as soon as the race was called out through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, my, what begins to befall those people? Well, the first glaring act, of course, is when the brothers sold Joseph down into slavery. Hatred. Sin. See? All right, now you come all the way up through their, uh, through their history. Now there comes all of this, what we think is, how could those people who have been blessed so richly be so blind and practice such unbelief? Well, because Satan knows and he works on them constantly that if he can get Israel out of the way, then he's the winner. All right, bring you all the way up to the book of Esther. What happened in the book of Esther? Well, old Haman convinced the king to set out a decree that would kill every Jew in the empire because they were the problem. And so the king fell for it. Fortunately, God had his own little Jewish girl in the right place at the right time. And thanks to Esther, the whole thing fell apart. But did Satan quit? No, he keeps on. And so everything is directed to stop God's program. All right, when Christ is born. Why in the world did Herod put out the decree to kill all the boy babies under the age of two? To hopefully get that Christ child that has been born in that two-year interval. Well, why kill the Christ child? Oh, that's what Satan wanted. All right, you take it on up to the work of the cross, even as many of you have now seen the movie, The Passion. Oh, what was behind the whole scenario? Satanic power. The satanic power to keep it all from happening. And so all the way down now since, it's the same scenario. Satan working over time to stop God's prophetic scriptures. And so why the hatred of Israel tonight? Why the threat to throw them into the sea? Why the threat to get rid of every Jew on the planet again? Oh, that's what Satan wants. Because if Israel is gone, then everything falls apart. Never lose sight of that. And so this is the reason that they are so hated and so despised is because Satan knows that without them, God's promises would fail. All right, now let's continue on in Jude in the couple minutes we have left. Now verse 7, he jumps us up to another Old Testament event that almost every good Jew knew about, and hopefully most people who have anything to do with the Bible and Christianity today would know about, and that is Sodom and Gomorrah. The cities about them, not just the two, but even the little suburbs, in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, in other words, gross immorality, and going after strange flesh, in other words, that which was against normality, they're set forth as a what? An example. Now, why can't the world read this? 
Sodom and Gomorrah came under the judgment of God, not just to punish that group of people, but to tell the rest of the human race what God thinks about that kind of activity. It was an example showing us God's reaction to the lifestyle of the Sodom and Gomorrahites. But all the world can't learn. The world just can't learn. And so they were set as an example. And as that example, they suffered the vengeance of eternal fire. But they're not alone. Everyone who lives in that lifestyle is going to that same place. And, of course, the thing that exercises me is you all know by now that I love history. And all you have to do is go back and look at history. In fact, I was telling, I think, a TV group the other day. Do you know that 15 of the last 16 Roman emperors were homosexuals? And out of those 15 or 16 of the last emperors of Rome, only two lived to a normal life end. They were either murdered, poisoned, assassinated. That's the kind of a society you get when they take over. It's historically proven that any empire that came under that influence went down the two. And of course, Rome is the most uh, graphic. And we're to learn from it. That's the whole idea of being an example. Now let me show you what Peter says about it. We looked at it a few weeks ago when we were in uh, Peter's little epistle. But see, the Bible is just saturated with all this. And it's to tell us that this is not an alternative lifestyle. Now the reason that God doesn't love them, God loves sinners of any stripe. And he will save them to the uttermost. But he's going to bring down judgment wherever it becomes a complete practice of society. It's coming. And the whole world will come under the judgment sooner or later. But look what Peter says about it in chapter 2. Oh, I'm not going to have time enough, am I? Well, anyway, we'll pick it up in our next program. See, that last two minutes always get away from me. And uh, we'll pick this up in our next program, Second Peter chapter 2. <clears throat> Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries. 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felding.